second and third Avatar film, and I'm going to direct those. I'm committed to writing and directing those. And we're going to do them as a kind of conjoined production, where there'll be a four, it'll be four years before we release the first one, and then the second one will come out a year later. So the, the second and third will form essentially the, 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 the second and third acts of a greater story arc, but they'll also stand alone. And tell us the plots. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if you think I'm going to say that. <laughs> Just show us your source code, will you? Interesting. When I'm, when I'm writing it, I have a sense of the potential of what it could be, but it's all in a big out of focus image. I'm, I'm feeling the sense of strong color. I don't know what the colors are yet, if I can describe it that way. So now, my first step is to work with the artists. And by artists, I'm, I'm not talking necessarily about, about CG artists. It starts with guys with pencils. And, and now they work primarily in Photoshop and they do their paintings, their renderings in Photoshop. But you start playing with color, you start playing with form, you start designing the creatures and the plants and all those. And when, and when the walls are covered with artwork, then I feel I can go write the script. I start with a story, then I challenge the artist to start, start showing me the world, and it slowly, slowly comes to the <coughs> And once I know what the creatures look like, what the characters look like, then I wrote the script. Because now I felt I could inhabit, inhabit that world. And then the script, of course, is the starting point for a more conventional production paradigm cast actors and, and so on. But of course, many of our actors were not actually appearing on sets or appearing in front of a, a, a you know, mechanical, optical camera. They were, they were being performance captured. And so you know, the, biggest, the biggest risk for us was that the performance capture component of it wasn't going to work or not work up to a level of, com of complete translation of the human emotion and affect. Of the many things that Avatar invented in the technology and movement, you invented this thing you call performance capture, where people actually have suits on with right. dots, right. and using lasers and other technology, you actually watch them move as humans, yeah. and then you map that onto CGI. Sure. What was the underlying technology insight that allowed you to do that? Well, there's, there, was an, there was an early layer of foundation that we built on, and that was motion capture. And we'd used motion capture on Titanic, and it had been around before that. It was basically a marker suit. <laughs> And that allowed us to track the body motions of the actors, but it wasn't very good for capturing faces. And marker-based facial capture had been done for some time, but it, but it was very kludgy. It didn't really work. So we came up with the idea of image-based capture, where we created a head rig with a little camera on it that actually basically shot video of the actor's face, but it was nulled out. It was locked to them as they, as they moved. So it created a, a kind of fixed data set of the displacement of all their facial muscles and their eyes and so on. And then it was all image analysis algorithms that were used to extract the, the, the drivers for, the, for the, the, the mesh of the CG character after that. But the thing that most people don't understand is it's not about capturing a perfect image of the face. It was actually somewhat sloppy sometimes the camera would move around. It was a flawed data set. What was important was to train the system to understand the actor. And we would do that by having the actor actually the actors who read the scenes for the movie in a, in a, a, a kind of a, a matrix of like 12 HD cameras. So we understood how the actors' faces worked. And that cruder data set that we got in the moment when they were performing the scene what was, was really just driving a very, very sophisticated, sophisticated rigging job on the CG character. So the CG character had accounted for all of the, the neuromuscular kind of system of the actor's face. The funny part was, every actor was different. So it didn't matter who it was, you couldn't, you couldn't sort of spend nine months doing one actor and then a month doing the others. It was nine months very well. And curiously, it was nine months. And before the character came to life, it was not a nine month process. 
But do you think that? I mean, again, you literally invented this. You're like the inventor of this technology. We were converging a lot of stuff. But all inventors use the work of others, yeah. and they synthesize into extraordinary things. Exactly. Do you believe that this technique will ultimately be a one-week technique that's broadly used? In other words, as it gets processed, so that people learn from your I think, invention? Yeah, I think that's a fair question, because I think there was this sense that, okay, Avatar is kind of showing how movies are going to get made. And I don't think movies are going to get made like Avatar, other than movies like Avatar that are imaginative films that have quasi-human characters, whether they're you know, witches or werewolves or demons or aliens or whatever it is, but something that could be acted or performed by a human being. If it's a, if it's a talking moose, it doesn't need performance capture. It's going to be done by animators. And if it's closer to human than that, then simple makeup is sufficient. So it's, it's, so it's always going to be a bit of a niche. But I think we'll, but, it's, but it's a niche that a lot of filmmakers are very interested in. One of the other mo most beautiful scenes, in my view, are the flying scenes when they're yeah. off at the two um, animals, I guess, and the describes them flying around, uh, looking at each other in love. Um, the the flying scenes were actually shot on the rigging. They were literally yeah. on a fake animal, right? Right in this bodysuit, which was more than just faces that you had to mechanize. We're, we're capturing the bodies. It's a total facial body performance, and, and to have the, the actors perform flying a creature, I was never satisfied with how, how that had been done. I really wanted these to be the best flight scenes you've ever seen. I wanted you to have that sense of vertigo and plummeting and, and the sense of soaring and, and, and the beauty of it, as you so say. To me, the beauty was a critical part of the, of the film. It, to me, the film was about contrasting grandeur and intimacy and contrasting stark terror and absolute beauty, you know, because I think that it's in these dynamic polarizations that we have a full experience. One more question about technology before we move to some other things. You are you are clearly on the record that stereoscopic imaging, dual cameras, 3D imaging is going to be everywhere. Yeah. Do you fundamentally believe this will occur, you know, a year, a decade? Take us through how your You've essentially popularized it at a level that no one has done before. Right. So, who's going to now make it a volume thing? How's it going to happen with my television? Why will all the cameras have two, two lenses? That sort of thing. Right. Well, we see it in 3D. It's how we see the world. And, and so much of our world right now is about screens, about monitors, and how we interact with data. How we, you know, we sit at screens all day long and we go blindly for our relaxation. We watch screens. So this is, you know, look, it's our lives. So in our case, we sit in front of screens in the last one we're talking about. Exactly, sometimes multiple screens. That's right. So if you, can, if you can find a way to fundamentally rewrite the contract between human beings and, and, and their visual media, then I think that's something that, that uh, is compelling. So, you know, I went down that path. And, uh, to me, there are no barriers to, to 3D ubiquity in five to 10 years. Um, I think a big breakthrough will be when it comes into the home, which initially will be probably be driven by sports and gaming, but also, you know, it could be could be episodic, you know, broadcast broadcast programming and so on as well. The, the sets are there. The consumer electronic companies jumped out in front of it and got the sets out there. There's, I think there's a, a couple of million of them that shipped just this year. Uh, right now, there's a dearth of content, so the content providers have to catch up, which means the the, you know, the networks uh, have to start programming in 3D, and they're already coming to the various 3D content makers and saying, how do we do this, right? And so we're working with different networks in terms of how to get them up to speed and converting their product. It's all a little bit ahead of it right now, because I don't think, you know, the big breakthrough is going to be when, when it's an auto-stereoscopic display that you can have in the home on a 50 or 60-inch monitor. What does that mean? It means you don't need the glasses. Okay. So I think... And, and how does that work technically? Uh, well, it, we're about four to five years away on that for a number of reasons. So much of the energy of, of display making has gone into higher frame rates, and now we're up to 240 hertz, and we'll probably go higher than that. And that's great for uh, 3D with glasses because it's a time series display, left eye, then right eye, then left eye. Yeah, for those who don't, basically you see one image and then another, and there's a polarizing lens, which is what those glasses are. Right, or it's sometimes an LCD shutter glasses. Yeah, there's different ways of doing it. But, but what they need to go to, go to is more pixels in the, in the actual uh, image matrix, in the actual area array, because they need to be able to decode to different viewer positions. Yes. Because right now, you can have people in different viewer positions wearing the glasses, and the decoding is done by the glasses. Take the glasses away, you got to have sweet spots. And those sweet spots subdivide the total resolution of the screen. So there's breakthroughs in resolution. There's 
breakthroughs in actual display manufacturing that have to happen before we can have big displays for multiple viewers in the hall. But I think when that happens, then it's good. Because small, like laptops, laptops are here now. Laptops are a single user paradigm for the most part. Um, and so that's, that's easy, that's already, that's already available. Uh, and smaller devices as well. So, you know, as resolution comes, and these are all Moore's Law government things, as resolution comes up, uh, it'll, it'll just naturally evolve. So the biggest challenge right now is content. Teaching people how to make good content in 3D. Because the thing that will hold it back, the biggest barrier I see is poor quality 3D when people are being asked to pay extra for it. More for the displays, more for the movie ticket, whatever it is. And it seems to me that another, another invention needs to be uh, authoring systems for 3D gaming. Exactly. Uh, just, as you know, gaming is driving a lot of the computer industry and the volume point around gaming is, is a phenomenal lucrative. Sure, sure. And it's a natural, you know, so you have to make it comfortable. So you could, because, you know, it's not like watching a movie for two hours. You know, gamers will sit there for eight hours, ten hours. So it's got to be comfortable. And, and the thing that the people need to uncouple in their minds, the technology of comfort from the authoring of good stereo, which is a set of creative functions that are actually within the image itself. You can run good stereo on a mediocre display or a mediocre system and have a great experience. And the converse is true and, as well. And you were fortunate that the new 3D digital technology in movies was able to piggyback on top of the distribution of digital cameras in the first place and provide digital projection of movies. Right. So it made it cost effective right. uh, to have a high quality 3D movie theater to go to. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, exactly, that's exactly accurate, but there's an interesting wrinkle to it, which is that I got excited about 3D. I saw this coming wave, this coming rollout of digital cinema, and my assumption was it's going to happen anyway. The economics of it was safe. But the, the movie industry dithered and, and kept pointing fingers at whose responsibility it was and got worried about security issues and encryption, and they slowed down. The log jam was actually broken by 3D. Well, I had always thought 3D would ping back, and so I thought, okay, I'll just get all my ducks in a row ready for the big digital rollout, and we'll just sit on top of that. It turned out that the 3D actually was a catalyst that drove the rollout. So it actually was the tail of the dog. I'm sure, by the way, you're the only person in Hollywood who actually understands Moore's Law, which is great to have you part of this. Let's talk a little bit now more about, and I think the technology we can explore with other people's questions. Let's talk a little bit about the other part of, I think, your gift and the things that you care about, which has to do with the narrative. And Avatar can be understood as a narrative around ecology and tolerance and respect for other ideas and societies and so forth. You clearly feel very strongly with that, about that. Uh, you've been heavily involved in a project in Brazil involving indigenous species, which is highly in the show. Thank you for your help. Yeah, we will help there a little bit. Um, talk a little bit about why you care so much about that 